Hello and welcome to the second emergency podcast from drcrunch.co.uk. I'm Sheena. And I'm Viral. And today's topic is going to be on diabetic ketoacidosis. First, we'd like to discuss the pathophysiology of DKA and then move on to a case study where we'll highlight the diagnosis, management and investigations. And then we'll do a simulated history of the stabilised patient. We'll include a case study based on a true story, which will involve three characters. The registrar, Dr Polo. The medical student, Biggles. And the patient, Jacques Tricoleur. Before we get on to the case, we're just going to spend one minute going over what happens in DKA. DKA is caused by an absolute lack of insulin, which distinguishes it from the hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state that's more common in type 2 diabetes. That state used to be called honk. A lack of insulin will have three main effects. Number one, an increase in the glucose levels. Number two, an increase in fatty acid oxidation. And number three, potassium will tend to drift out of the cells. Uh, Sheena's now going to tell us a little bit more about each of those. Initially, the increased glucose levels will cause an increased amount of glucose to be filtered at the glomerulus. This will surpass the renal reuptake threshold. This leads to glycosuria and osmotic diuresis and ultimately dehydration. The increased fatty acid usage leads to the production of ketones. And these ketones eat up the base reserve which will lead to ketoacidosis. And finally, a bit about potassium. There are two reasons why potassium tends to drift out of cells in DKA. Normally, insulin pushes potassium into cells. With the lack of insulin in DKA, this can't happen. The increased hydrogen concentration in the plasma in DKA leads to an increased potassium concentration in the plasma. This is because hydrogen and potassium tend to follow each other. We'll now begin our case. Mr Jacques Tricolor, a 24-year-old gentleman, is coming in today feeling very unwell for the last six hours. He has been passing water ten times per day and has been drinking as much as he can. Pulse 110, blood pressure 94 over 63, respirate 29, oxygen saturations 99% on room air and temperature 37.9. Patient is unconscious and his glucose is noted to be 34. Thanks for that handover. I suspect DKA. There are three diagnostic criteria. Firstly, a capillary blood glucose above 11. Secondly, capillary ketones above 3 or urinary ketones 2 plus or more. And finally, a venous pH of less than 7.3 or bicarb less than 15. However, my priorities are firstly to rehydrate the patient also to start an insulin infusion, and to also assess the patient in order to confirm my diagnosis. Biggles, how are we going to rehydrate the patient? Well, Dr Polo, I would start with a saline infusion. If their systolic blood pressure were below 90 millimetres of mercury, then I'd give the first 500 mils over 10 to 15 minutes and probably involve ITU. If it's over 90 millimetres of mercury, then I could give one litre over about one hour. And how would you give the insulin? I would use a fixed rate intravenous insulin infusion. The initial rate would be 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. Assessing the patient, which investigations would you like to do? Well, if we think about the diagnostic criteria, we're going to need to do a capillary and lab glucose. We want to do a venous blood gas. We'd want to do a urine dipstick. And then to get an idea of the level of dehydration, we need to do a use knees. To look for a cause, I do full blood count, blood cultures, MSU and a chest x-ray for a possible infection and I'd like to take an ECG both for any possible ischemic events and also to affect, to look at the effect of potassium on the heart. And who would you send to ITU? So the people who need to be referred, you can split them into patient factors and disease factors. So patient factors would be the very young, uh, typically young people aged between 18 and 25 because they're at high risk of cerebral edema. Uh, the elderly, pregnant patients, people with heart failure or kidney failure. And disease factors would be anything that suggests a severe DKA, 
so blood ketones, say, above 6, venous bicarb below 5, venous pH below 7.1. The exact numbers don't matter so much, it's just an idea that this is severe DKA. They need to go to ITU. And how would you manage this potassium? So the amount of potassium replacement we'd give would be dependent on the potassium level. We usually wouldn't give potassium in the first bag because you can only really get potassium, uh, get rid of it through the renal route. And if you're not, you haven't got a decent urine output, then you're just going to hold it in. Um, so the, if the potassium level is less than 3.5, then you need to get a senior opinion on what you do with potassium. If it's between 3.5 and 5.5, then you'd replace it uh, at a level of 40 millimoles per litre. And if the potassium is above 5.5, then you wouldn't give any. So having fluid resuscitated your patient and started an insulin infusion, what are your priorities for the next six hours? My priorities for the next six hours would be number one, a rise in bicarbonate of three millimoles per litre per hour and a fall in blood glucose of three millimoles per litre per hour. Number two, to maintain serum potassium in the normal range. And number three, to avoid hypoglycemia. So what would your fluid regime be like in, in, within this time period and what else would you do? Oh, it's a common question they like to ask medical students. The guidelines have changed and they probably will change again. But at the moment, that's 2012, uh, it's one litre of saline uh, over the two, next two hours, then another litre over the next two hours, another litre over the next four hours. And you would add 10% glucose uh, if the blood glucose falls below 14 millimoles per litre. Remember that this is the fluid after you've already resuscitated the patient. During this time period, there need to be regular assessments, particular vital signs. So at a minimum, this would include hourly blood glucose, hourly blood ketones, and uh, venous blood classes. Initially, hourly, then maybe two hourly thereafter, depending on uh, what they're like. Potassium would also need to be monitored quite regularly, particularly if they're at either end of the normal range or if they're outside the normal range. Um, and this is the kind of patient who you really want an early warning score on, um, with a low threshold for seeking senior input. Um, you need an accurate fluid balance chart, so the patient will need to be catheterized so you can check the urine output. It's at least a, a, mil, a half a mil per kilogram per hour. Um, and uh, you'd want to keep a SATS probe on the patient and uh, keep a check on the oxygen while this is going on. Uh, you also need to use thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin in any patient who is hyperosmotic. And what are your treatment targets for the next six hours? Well, they're broadly pretty similar. You want to keep monitoring that patient regularly, looking at the vital signs. Uh, what's different is you're also now looking for complications of treatment. So fluid overload or cerebral edema, as mentioned, particularly in younger patients with cerebral edema, particularly in elderly patients with heart failure for fluid overload. Uh, you'd also be looking for uh, any precipitating factors and treating them if possible, typically an infection. And what about the targets for the 12 hours after that? Well, by this stage, the acidosis and the ketones should really be resolving. And resolution is defined as ketones being less than 0.3 millimoles per litre and a venous pH of more than 7.3. So we'd be seeking biochemical evidence of resolution. We'd also be looking for clinical evidence of resolution. So is the patient just looking better? Are they sitting up? Are they eating and drinking? Um, and as before, we'd be doing uh, regular assessments, particularly if the patient were more unwell. Um, we'd also be thinking about, can we transfer this patient to subcut insulin? And of course, you can only do this if the patient is eating and drinking as normal. And how would you transfer them to subcut insulin? So, providing the patient has biochemically recovered and is eating and drinking, then you kind of have a bridging regime. So you'd have the patient started on a subcut insulin, and you wouldn't discontinue the IV infusion until 30 minutes later, so the patient has cover. Dr Polo, the patient seems a lot better. He seems to be dancing. Do you think we can go speak to him now? Hi, Mr Chikolo. Hello. I'm Dr Polo. I'm really pleased that you're feeling a lot better now. Um, but what I'd like to do is just find out a bit about how you were feeling before you came in, if that's okay. Oui, ça marche. That's good, yes. So tell me in your own words how you're feeling. Oh, doctor, not very good at all. Uh, feeling very uh, uh, sick, uh, dry. Uh, going to the uh, toilet uh, quite a lot. Too. Um, and uh, just feeling a bit confused. I see. I'm sorry about that. Um, and how long has all of this been going on for? No, oh, it's been about uh, maybe a day, a day or two. Uh, 
Have you been passing more water than usual? Ha, uh, oui, oui. I see. And did you find yourself to be more thirsty than usual? Bah oui, oui. Um, and apart from this, had you, did you notice any other symptoms, such as changes to your vision or your weight? Yeah, yes, I've been uh, gaining a little bit of weight uh, over the last uh, maybe week or two. And what about your mood? Um, more irritated than usual? Je alors! Maybe a little, yes. Biggles, why? Hyperglycemia, doctor. Any breathlessness at all? Uh, doctor, it is a bit strange. I'm usually a very fit man, but uh, I'll be feeling a little bit breathless at rest. Biggles, why did I ask that? Oh, you've been asking that because of ketoacidosis. Uh, doctor, uh, no, no, a little bit of pain in the, the belly, yes, and uh, I have been vomiting uh, maybe twice today. It's not, it's not nice. And before this time, how were you feeling? Any coughs, colds or anything? Both. Uh, maybe I've been feeling a bit uh, under the weather, a bit of a sniffle. Any chest pain at all? Uh, no, not at all, Doctor. Biggles, so why have I asked these questions? Uh, you're looking for possible triggers, Doctor. Such as an infection or a myocardial infarction. Any family history of any diabetes? Uh, not at all, Doctor. And do you take any medications? Uh, no, no medication. And what about yourself? How have you been in the past, your health? I've had no problems at all. I've had no, no problems. No, doctor. That was a Dr. Crunch podcast with Sheena Ramyad and Viral Thakra. If you like what we're doing, uh, if you just want to give us some feedback or if you have anything to say, please visit drcrunch.co.uk where you'll find more SBAs, Oski sheets, videos, animations, general medical goodness. For the DKA, we've based this podcast on the guidance given on Diabetes UK, where there is a PDF file which has an amazing poster which talks you through the management. So once again, thanks for listening. Please do drop us uh, an email or some form of communication to let us know how we're doing.